Right, Yay, thank you, Deborah. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. I think we've got 27 people here now. That's fantastic. Uh, welcome to this Valuing Lived Experience in Post-Qualifying Social Work Conference. Um, we've got an exciting program for you this morning. We have a um, wonderful keynote speaker, and we're going to hear how this project has gone, uh, hear from the people who, with lived experience, who've delivered the training. But Deborah's going to start by just giving us some background on how the project uh, came into being in the first place. Lovely. Thanks. Thank you, David. And um, and yeah, um, welcome, everybody. Um, just to let you know, this session is being recorded so that we can use it as a, a learning resource um, on our website. Um, so could I ask people now just to turn cameras off and put microphones on mute unless you're speaking? That just helps things flow a bit more and in terms of connection and things as well. Um, but obviously, if, if at any point you are asking a question, um, then please do turn your camera on. We'd love to see you. Um, there um, you are able to ask questions in the chat as well and we'll keep an eye on that and as you can see um, somebody has left their camera on so this is um, Anna who uh, who's from New Possibilities and is our illustrator um, for this morning. Um, oh we've just lost you Anna. <laughs> um, so there we go, there we go. So Anna is illustrating this morning um, for us. And um, so if at any point you would like to, um, yeah, so obviously you can see Anna's screen at, at the moment, but you're also able to pin her screen as well. Um, so if you click the, the three dots that are sort of next to Anna's name on her picture, you should see a, um, a button that says pin for me. And um, so you'll be able to see what she's um, doing, but we'll also um, go to her at the end um, as well. And she'll, you'll be able to view what she's done so far she'll be sharing her image with us um, after the conference probably tomorrow and we'll be able to share um, her illustrations with you as well and so we're very excited to, to have her with us so thank you Anna um, and um, yeah so ju just to remind you as well just to be mindful of, of what you share um, during sort of questions and discussions because the, the session is is being recorded um, so my name is Deb Stewart I'm a consultant social worker from the West Midlands Social Work Teaching Partnership and the our teaching partnership is one of 27 uh, in the country and um, we also have 27 partners so that's organizations like universities and local authorities um, we work together with our partners, so academics and social workers and um, leaders from these organisations. And we also bring together people with lived experience as well to support us um, to make social work, teaching and training and practice the best it can be in the region. Um, so we do that through a number of different ways, many different ways, in fact. Um, one of those ways is um, by applying for funding for projects such as this one that you're going to hear about today. Um, but we also do a lot more than that um, in terms of um, CPD and um, different projects that you can find more out about um, on our website, where you can also sign up for our newsletter um, as well. Um, so this project came about because the Department for Education offered some funding to teaching partnerships for continuous improvement. Um, we have a group within our teaching partnership of um, people with lived experience um, and also sort of partners who who work um, in the field of um, sort of co-production and participation. Um, so together um, a bid was co-produced and put to the Department for Education saying that we would like um, as, as a group to um, work um, to bring the value of lived experience into the training for newly qualified social workers. Um, so that I, without further ado, I'll pass over to uh, to David, um, who is one of our project leads and also a person with lived experience, um, to introduce the project um, and give you a bit of, of background um, as, to, as to how it came about. Thank you, Deborah. Um, can I just let you know as, as well that Vic Kelly Tears just WhatsApp me to say she can't find a link to get in. If you could possibly um, resend that to her, that would Thanks. be brilliant. I will send, I'll send that to her now, no problem. Thanks, David. 
thank you. And can you share my slides for me? Oh, brilliant. There we go. So um, I first heard about uh, this participation project back in September last year. Um, I, I'm a member of IMPACT, which is Worcester University's service user and care organisation, and um, went along to a couple of meetings. Um, can you go on to the next slide for me, please, Deborah? So, um, Deborah explained that um, the project was about delivering training to social workers in their ASYE year. Um, and the first task was to find a local authority to participate. And Walsall Children's Services um, volunteered, came forward, and they were identified as meeting the brief, which was that they didn't have any um, people with lived experience uh, involved in their ASYE training at the moment. So um, after a series of meetings with lots of people with lived experience from HEIs all over the teaching partnership, um, we got underway and Peter Unwin, who is the um, senior lecturer at Worcester Uni who uh, organises the uh, service user and carer organisation, he and I um, became the project leads by, by default really because uh, we were the only volunteers. Um, so it was a very rigorous selection process, wasn't it, Deborah? Um, and uh, we started looking for um, people with lived experience who'd be willing and able to deliver training. And we um, started talking to Kim Ford at Walsall Children's Services and had a meeting with her in early November to find out what particular um, areas of training they were most interested in, in having delivered by people with lived experience. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? So in November, that meeting, we established what it was that um, Walsall wanted from us. We looked at how their ASYE training was structured currently. We uh, found out about numbers, which at the time was 48 um, ASYE social workers. And um, we, can we go to the next slide? Please, Deborah. So these are the areas that uh, Walsall decided, or, or rather that, that, that we, we agreed with Walsall were the areas that were going to cover. The, these were four of the priority areas. They, they gave us a list of um, eight different uh, potential topics. These are the four that they were most interested in. So we had gender and gender identity, um, particularly young people. And that was specifically asked for um, by social workers, seen as a gap in current training. Domestic abuse, um, particularly male survivors and the effects on children. Um, care experience young people. There are 650 looked after young people in Walsall. And gypsy Roma traveller experiences. And the overall focus for all four uh, was to be on uh, mental health. So having um, got that established, we then had basically um, the rest of November and December to try and find uh, people with lived experience to deliver the training. So that was all quite um, hectic and full on. But um, the, the people who, who came forward, I am um, still completely boggled by how wonderful they have been and how amazing the uh, presentations that they've 
uh, put together have been, uh, as well as the impact, I think, as well. So we scheduled, um, in the end, seven training days. Uh, it, it was originally just going to be one for each, but um, we had some discussions um, with Kim Ford about numbers and, and COVID issues. There were a lot of COVID issues in uh, the venue for the training, even though it was a quite a large room, uh, was only going to be able to accommodate 15 people at a time with social distancing. Um, so it was decided instead of trying to split days into two to ha having two identical half days for each um, area, we didn't want to water the training down. So um, it was decided to do two full days on each, um, the exception being the um, care experience young people day, which was done as two half days. And that was organized by um, David Hughes, the children's champion uh, for Walsall. Um, the days were scheduled to start at the end of January. Um, we had some hiccups. We had uh, a presenter un unexpectedly summoned back to hospital, not well. So we had to postpone um, the first one. And the sessions were delivered uh, in February and uh, the first week in March. The last one was delivered on the 4th of March. And um, can we have the, the final slide, please? Deborah. Final slide. Yeah, I have moved go. it on, David. There might just be a bit. There of we a go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of a lag. Um, so we finished delivering the training on the 4th of March and the project leads are working now on the evaluation report, um, looking at all the feedback that we've had. Uh, we've had feedback forms via um, SurveyMonkey, <clears throat> and we've also had individual written feedback uh, from each of the sessions. We're going to be looking at some of that um, later on. So the whole thing has been put together really in, well, three months, I suppose, which is uh, a testament to how wonderful all the um, people involved have been. So I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker now. Um, unless anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask at this stage before we move on. No. So I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Peter Beresford, OBE, as our keynote speaker today. Peter's had a long and varied career as a user of mental health services, an academic and social commentator. He's currently visiting professor at the University of East Anglia and co-chair of Shaping Our Lives, whose national influence regarding involvement and lobbying across health and care services is so well respected. Peter has influenced generations of activists, practitioners and academics through his extensive and incisive publications and social commentary. Always the advocate of co-production and a style of working together that values lived experience equally alongside other forms of knowledge. We are delighted to have him with us today and hand over to you, Peter. Hello, I hope um, I hope people can see me OK. Can can you see me all right? Yes, we can, Peter. Okay, great, thanks. Um, th thanks for, for those really kind words. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, it really is great to be here with you today, virtually, albeit. Uh, I will say something about myself, although I think the work's largely been done now. Um, I've called this presentation, which I'm having to read from notes. I hope you'll forgive me, but I can't do it or just from my head. 
uh, all of us. Um, all of us, and that's because in a range of senses, it's what I really want to try and talk about today. I, I could have added all of us in very difficult times. Uh, that's not only because of the awful things that we know are happening in Eastern Europe and the terrible sense they generate of how things can still be like that in the world. But of course, um, equally bad, if not worse, things are also happening in many places, including the Yemen and Syria, and they don't even make headlines. These are difficult times. Uh, but we don't, in my opinion, have to go very far to see really bad things. Really bad things, I think, are happening in this country too. That's why everybody and what everybody brings to the table through their lived experience and what sometimes has helpfully, I think, been called practice wisdom is important and has key insights to offer at many levels. I think social work has been positively involved in some of the nastiest things uh, that we've been seeing here. Uh, now and, and recently. Refugees trying to cross the channel, being turned back, drowning and needing help. Older and disabled people put through the ringer, through the cruelty of benefits policy, which has led to deaths, to people thinking about killing themselves and people being driven to kill themselves. And children and families being at their wits end and social workers still going the extra mile under lockdowns to make home visits, but of course no clapping for them as I remember. Yet all these these things are social work's business and people uh, here, here today in your different ways and in different roles and with different experience and identities all connect with it. I, I'm going to try and talk for about 20-25 minutes so that there's then opportunities for people to say what they want to say, maybe ask questions, open up the conversation if that's all right. Uh, as, as we've heard, I'm co-chair of Shaping Our Lives, which I'm very proud to be. And what I think I'm especially proud about is that we are a mix of people with different uh, experiences of impairment, of distress, all sorts of things. Uh, but we've also long worked in trying to make it possible for people to have more control over their lives, more say in what the services and support there is out there to try and address issues around what people call difference. Um, so that people, however differently anyone might seek to identify, can be treated with equality and challenge what I see as the rising levels of exclusion and discrimination that many people face in our society. Um, as you heard, I, I'm, I'm a long term user of mental health services myself, but also had about seven years living on welfare benefits. Although I, I have to say, I don't think it was as bad then uh, as it is now, not that it was very nice. Uh, and you've heard I work at the University of East Anglia part time uh, on a research project where the part we're playing is trying to do what you're all doing, which is to involve people with lived experience. One of the projects that we're developing jointly with people in what we're really hoping is a proper co-production way, and it, it rings bells with the work you've been doing and the priorities, uh, is about involving travellers, Roma and gypsies to get health services which connect with them in, in a good way, uh, which aren't oppressive and which don't leave them out. Um, taking the cue from what they are saying as equal people uh, they want. Involvement's always been the focus of my work and I, I really suppose now of my life. I worked for a long time with social work students at Brunel University in London. That was a privilege uh, and have more generally been involved in campaigning, research uh, and occupational and professional training, concerned with equalising the relationships between people as service users, as workers and carers. And I want just to say a little bit more about what I think the context is for today for me. Uh, these are my personal thoughts I'm stressing, which you may not share, that's fine. But I do, as I've already suggested, believe we live in a harsh, increasingly polarised world here and internationally, where we know evidence shows poverty and inequality have been rising massively. I think these are terrible times. I think they are the worst uh, in living memory, where protections for democracy, social justice against poverty, violence and so on have all been badly weakened and attacked. 
we know that it's not a one sided business. People are struggling hard against that, epitomized by the Me Too and Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movements. But on the ground, how awful things have become routinized, just commonplace, we can see. So I'm thinking, for example, a year ago of the murder of Sarah Everard by a serving policeman and the ripples of racist and sexist behaviour and attitudes that as a result have been revealed. And the appalling police behaviour before that, following the killing of sisters Biba Henry and Nicole Smallman, two black women who were stabbed to death in 2020. And where the kind of politics we have here uh, and internationally not only make things worse for many people, but also determinedly cuts the support uh, including social work support available to people then facing those bigger problems, oppressions and difficulty. Uh, the truth is I believe that social work has been so weakened in many ways, more control over it, more restriction, more bureaucratic oversight, less independence and autonomy, less valuing of social work principles, more top down, emphasis on control and firefighting rather than support and getting to know and form relationships with people, more preoccupation with budgets, much less with rights and needs. But I do think, and I think today's just another terrific expression of this, uh, social workers challenge this, maybe not the leadership, sadly, but the face to face practitioners, the educators, the rest who seek to honour the values and commitment of their profession, who continue to fight the battles against discrimination and oppression and for the understanding and anti-discrimination which social work has pioneered and been ridiculed for over the years but which are now recognized as the way to go and extend over all those concerns in relation to gender, ethnicity, age, disability, sexual orientation and trans issues. I've highlighted the problems but now I want to talk about the ways maybe of addressing them, ways consistent with the participatory thrust of social work, that commitment to social justice, to inclusion, to valuing diversity, to involvement in its qualifying, and we must hope post-qualifying and an and, and early time in practice. And again, this is about all of us. So when we're talking about such service user involvement, it's about trying to ensure everyone's potential involvement so we can get the whole picture. When shaping our lives did a big research project on this, we found there were five key groups who tended to get left out of participatory schemes and who needed to be reached out to to challenge that if their voices were going to be in there. And that was that, that exclusion was on the basis, obviously, first equality issues in relation to gender, sexuality, race, class, culture, belief, age, trans issues, impairment and more. But also where people live, if, if you're homeless, in prison, in welfare institutions or people's homes, refugee, if you're a refugee and so on, uh, communicating differently if you don't speak the prevailing language, if it's not your first language, if you're deaf, use sign language and so on. And the nature of your impairment, if, you're, if, if that impairment is seen as too complicated or, or severe, so that there's an assumption that you couldn't or wouldn't want possibly uh, to be part of things. And, and this is what I always think is the, the interesting one, especially where you're seen as unwanted voices. You don't necessarily say what the authorities want to hear. You're seen as a potential problem, as disruptive, as a nuisance. So I'm arguing, of course, and I know that you'll be on the, on, this, on the same page, diverse and inclusive involvement is important, but it's also important that involvement can extend opportunities for all of us as service users and carers. And an important sense in which this is possible is not only through such involvement in social work education, at qualifying and post qualifying levels, etc. But the further opening up of social work opportunities to all of us, it's been great how and I've seen it happen over a relatively short time that uh, we've experienced as service as a service user of uh, being that being seen as something to stop you being suitable to be uh, a, a social worker actually as an objection to your suitability to being seen as a real potential asset 
So increasingly in the UK and elsewhere, people are being recruited to be social workers who've experienced as service users, where, where they're also obviously able to demonstrate they've got the other necessary skills and qualities to be good practitioners, reinforced by that personal experience. Uh, in addition, social work practitioners and others in health and social care in turn also, I've seen it happen, have begun to feel confident enough to come out about their own experiences of disability and distress and childcare and other issues to argue that these could represent strengths rather than weaknesses for practice. Em increasing empathy and understanding with service users, building trust and encouraging openness and confidence between them. And that brings me uh, briefly to Power Us, uh, a European network of social work educators, carers and service users, which started in Sweden and it's highlighted, I think, something really key to our, our conversation today, finding new ways of bringing us together as practitioners and service users. And that's been based on the idea which they came up with of mending the gap. And that was that that was meaning bringing together the and challenging the gap that they saw between service users and carers and social work, social workers and social work students uh, on social work courses to work together, all of them equally on a module. And it's been going for a while, quite a while, and it works and has been extended internationally, including to the UK. And it shifted these different groups on the receiving end and being the practitioner notably, I think from suspicion and misunderstanding about each other to the development of new trust and appreciation has to be the way to go. And it's another reminder that we aren't talking about two groups of people here. We're talking about all of us, as I've said, in different relations through our situation, experience and so on. And as we've seen, professional social work education has emerged as a particularly significant site for change, to change the culture of practice by changing the socialization of, of new practitioners, how you become a social worker. Uh, service users have emphasized the, emphasized the importance of educators and trainers listening to them, being guided by them. We've seen it today and building on what they find helpful in the learning. We should remember though, mind you, I think that occupational professional training has only been one of, of several, but I think particularly two key sites for the user involvement advanced by service users movements in our organisations. I think the other that's no less important, uh, which I'm sure you're interested in too, has been research and knowledge development. That's because of the major role that research can play as a key source of knowledge. And that leads us to the issue of the knowledge base of social work and health and welfare more generally, and also ultimately uh, as to why it's so important that the perspectives of service users and indeed practitioners, people are actually at the front line doing the work, um, that they've both, I believe, been tended to be neglected and devalued. And I think that's partly to do with the fact that user knowledge has tended to be seen as inferior. Uh, it's only true that the, the, the kind of assumption goes if, if, it's, if knowledge creation is scientific, experimental, uh, objective, research and that's what research has come to be assumed to be but that assumption has now I think come under crucial challenge and it, it, again it brings it back brings things back to my title now we need to bring the knowledge of all of us I'm suggesting to the table and that of course as as the proof of the pudding is here today starts with service user knowledge and central to that I think is is its introduction the introduction of and valuing of what's come to be called and I think you call experiential knowledge. You talk about people with lived experience. That's to say knowledge based on people's lived experience, what they know from inside them, what people call subjective understanding, rather than just a professional training or research and experiment. I'm not saying they've got nothing to offer, but not devaluing lived experience such experiential knowledge i think has if we're honest been granted less value and credibility uh, given traditional uh, very formal research values and principles all the old stuff about men in white coats but the knowledge claims of researchers without such direct experience 
while they're still seen to be stronger, I think we need to be braver in, in our challenge to them. Service users coming into that situation have turned some of those old arguments on their head. We've argued, there'll be people here today who've gone through all this, that by devaluing experiential knowledge, we lose a key knowledge source. We also highlight that this means crucially that if an individual has direct lived experience of issues like disability or poverty, of oppression and discrimination, of cuts and austerity, so-called, of, of, of racism and sexism, of transphobia and so on, when such traditional positivist research values are accepted, what they say, what you say as service users, your accounts and narratives will be seen as having less value, less authority. Because people experiencing hardship will be seen to be a bit close to the problem. You can't claim to be neutral, objective or distant as research goes on and on about and as demanded. So in addition, and this I think is a killer point really, to any discrimination and oppression that people may already experience by nature of their situation as service users and carers, they're also likely to be seen as less reliable and a less valid source of knowledge. So by that logic, uh, if someone's got experience of discrimination and oppression, they can expect to experience a further layer of, of, of discrimination and be further marginalized by being seen as having less credibility and being a less reliable source of knowledge. You couldn't make it up. It's shocking. The, the issue of marginalizing the knowledge of particular vulnerable groups has tended now begun to be talked about in terms of, I know it's a fancy word, but it, it shows it's getting to be recognized, epistemic exclusion uh, and epistemic injustice, meaning that what you know doesn't count as equal to what so-called experts know, and it's devalued and marginalized. Uh, if you're someone who's experienced abuse, discrimination and being oppressed, and there's now rising pressure for what people are calling epistemic justice, that everyone can, can contribute to creating a general knowledge base and that perspectives of entire social groups are no longer excluded uh, from this crucial, crucial process. We're beginning to see uh, the involvement of ordinary and disadvantaged people in research, for example, people with learning difficulties who communicate differently or experience dementia. And that 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 brings me to my to, to my almost my last point, which concerns again all of us in terms of what social workers, practitioners bring to the table. This concern with experiential knowledge also highlights important issues, I think, about the involvement of practitioners in knowledge formation. It brings us back now to the issue of the I think the frequent exclusion of current practitioners from mainstream social work discussion and discourse. It, it's not happening today, I hope, uh, I believe, but, but I think it's got really potentially negative consequences. I noticed that too many of the books about social work are not written by people who are social work practitioners now. And one survivor researcher called Yasna Russo has developed this discussion. She argues it's essential for the service user to be able to foster what she calls their first person perspective what they know is going on because it's happening to them. But she also worked as a social worker as a survivor. And while she believes it's crucial for accounts from the first person, the service user, or it may be the carer, to be valued and prioritized, she also introduced the second person into the discussion, the you. And for her here, the you is the social worker. If there's to be work and a meaningful equal relationship, between service user and practitioner, she says, the practitioner must recognize themselves as the second person in the relationship. It's between the two. They must be aware of themselves and bring themselves to it. Uh, that as a person has their in unique experiential knowledge as the service user, so does the worker as a practitioner, which has been described, I think, very helpfully as practice wisdom. What you learn from doing the job, and while it's not a substitute for user knowledge, it's an experiential knowledge of its own. A lot better, I think, than the distant views of policy makers and maybe senior managers. And it underpins the other half of the relationship between service users and practitioners, 
which we know is crucial for good social work. In, in addition, just as service users argue that, that we are much more than passive recipients of care and support, parents may be, partners, students, volunteers, community activists, workers and the rest. So social workers obviously are much more than just the sum of being a social worker. We all of us have complex and multiple identities. We only have to think of all the different roles and relationships each person may have. None of us is just one thing. We're not one uniform identity. We know identities are complicated, although sometimes we are made to simplify them. So social workers can bring much more than just their professional socialization and learning. Social workers have your own subjectivity, your own experiential as well as professional knowledge. Uh, I want to stress here the value of social workers feeling confident to draw on all of who they are, not to deny parts of themselves in their work, which I think has happened in the past and it's made people like into officials rather than human beings. Uh, reducing yourself to a narrow understanding of your professional role and status, as I think sometimes the powerful people want you to do, I think will only increase that gap uh, between service workers and users, risks, alienation, what people call othering and inequality. As, as has been seen, we should remember, there isn't a specific or separate group of service users. Uh, while we may be in many different places and relation to it, needing help and support is something in our increasingly harsh and unequal world that can happen to anyone, including, of course, people as social workers. Moreover, another of the valuable benefits of user involvement, as we've seen, has been that people with lived experience of hardship, loss, abuse, using services are now increasingly being positively recruited to become social workers with that experience, as I've said, being seen as a strength rather than a weakness. I've just got one last point I want to make about participation here, which again connects with my concern that we're talking about all of us. Social work, I think now is a valuable service, but it's been pressed narrower and narrower, and it's largely now only available to a narrow and narrowing range of people who would tend to be seen by policymakers as a problem or problem ridden. And I think that's a really bad mistake. I think social work of the kind I've talked about here and which many social workers aspire to practice is something that can really help all of us, particularly set a difficult time in our life or when hard things happen to us. So I want to suggest what's called a universalist social work, actually truly available to anyone as the way to go to the future. Uh, a sustainable social work with a commitment to all our futures, not least the future of the planet. Thanks very much. I'll stop there. Peter, thank you very much. Um, that was a very powerful and informative speech. Thank you so much. Um, I just would like to know if um, if anyone has any uh, questions um, for Peter. I think it's very key that his presentation is called All of Us. Um, I think it very much links in with our um, with our partnership um, as well um, and, um, and looking at the impact on that. Yes, Nigel. Uh, Nigel, you might be on mute because we can't hear you. Do you have a question? Uh, just to say to, thank you to Peter for a very powerful speech and uh, I think it can be summed up largely with one word that I believed all my life, which is fairness, fairness to all, everyone yeah. to get a fair crack of the whip. And I, I don't know, know that you remember me, Peter, but I used to come and see you down at a, a programme run by Sky called Social Work uh, Education Participation, which again, like many schemes, fell by lack of funding. And I'm That's just pleased that you've continued the good fight. I wish you luck. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. That was a lovely venture we tried there, uh, social social work education participation. And 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 by the time we became a charity, we lost all our money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Peter. Thanks, Nigel. Mark. Uh, Peter, just a question for you. Um, 
where this project is about post polyphonia. So, what's your view on co production in that once somebody post qualified as a social worker and actually doing a job? And also, just quickly, um, what's your view on co production in a financial sense as well? Right. Well, my, my first, the first thing I'd say, Mark, and it's nice to see you, uh, is that I, I worry that people do not get enough support in that first year, not because of the lack of commitment of, of, of middle managers and the rest, but I just think we have got such a, 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 a negative uh, kind of attitude in our society coming from the top about caring for each other, looking after each other. So it's, you know, you can't get thruppence for that. But you can get vast amounts of money to waste on private companies producing inappropriate and useless stuff uh, when you have the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, it, it doesn't work in a good way for all human beings. So I think that's a worry. I think there are lots of pressures uh, in our society against what people want to see from co-production. But at the same time, I do not think that rules it out. Uh, I think it just puts, I'm afraid, a bigger responsibility on those of us who are trying to advance co-production. So I think we have to be honest and realistic about co-production. There are big constraints, big restrictions, which can limit what you can do, but that does not limit how we try and work with each other as human beings. It does not stop any practitioner, in my opinion, especially a practitioner who's trying to, trying uh, to live determinedly by their professional ethics and also will throw those in the face of any manager who keeps pointing at the bottom line because that makes life very tough but there are ways that we can behave and make things possible on the basis of doing it together i think it, it you know uh, three of us did a, a study about end of life care social work and what was fascinating about that people who worked as spe specialist palliative care social workers and what was fascinating about that was how much valued that social work was by the people who received it and how you could see when you, we, we spoke to more than 100 people as service users you could see how what was happening was that it, it what, people weren't talking about it as co-production but people were jointly as practitioners and workers and carers uh, working out what would be best for the person it, it wasn't being imposed on them by the practitioner and it wasn't people as passive service users and 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 that that kind of face to face value obviously also needs a bigger environment to make it work well and that environment isn't often there for social workers so it's a struggle but you you know it's a struggle that where we will not get the whole loaf but half a loaf we certainly can work for uh, by dint of our commitment to 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 our values the values which service users constantly repeat you know, being respected, being treated as an equal, being listened to. That's always that one they go on about uh, being valued, challenging discrimination, all these things about good human behaviour to each other. And I think social work has been a pioneer of that and is still doing it. Thank you, Peter. Um, David, do you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Peter. That that was um, very powerful. I, I like the um, the way you marry the the social and political to give a, an overview of where we're all at. Um, in terms of this project, one of the the themes that's been really clear is four very different and disparate groups of uh, people with lived experience. Um, the people who uh, presented the gender identity awareness days, the people who did the domestic abuse days, the people who did the care experience days, the people who did the gypsy Romy traveller days, their common experience from society and by extension from social work as well is of, is of othering. They have all been othered. And um, even if you can get to the stage where you get to, to talk um, to social workers uh, and others to explain your experiences. The danger then 
uh, again, that I think we've all experienced is that you become defined by your issue. You're not seen as a whole person and don't have the capability to do other things. So what we're hoping comes out of this project is, is that <laughs> that sort of gets um, dealt with a little bit and that hopefully we get uh, to extend into CPD for social workers and other areas too in, in general. Um, I don't know if you've got any suggestions for um, how, how we can approach that. I, I mean, I, it does make me think about uh, uh, shaping our lives and especially earlier days in shaping our lives and, and how, you know, these are issues we've had to, uh, historically to grapple with. Because what one of the first things that we tried to do, uh, and it was a bit of an accident really, was was not just be concerned with one group of people as service users, not, not one group of disabled people. And of course, that meant that we'd be we would be made up of all sorts of different people. And you couldn't assume that all those different people would have an understanding of each other uh, or, or an awareness of people's different issues. And then if you try also to, to, to address in a proper and a, a thoroughgoing way e equality around uh, the issues, so-called protected identities, you know, of, of, of gender and, uh, uh, and all the rest of them. Of course, we only each of us, although we have, may have complex identities and be fit more than one box um, and know about things from that multiple vantage point, uh, we can't know how it is to be somebody else. And I think that has been and is ruthlessly exploited ruthlessly exploited by our policymakers and politicians we are determinedly and deliberately set it against each other so uh, if people don't mind me saying we have a government which has behaved in what i would say was an outrageous uh, quasi illegal way about people suffering as uh, refugees and, and would be immigrants that then um says that it's committed to supporting and rescuing people from the Ukraine, but of course has in place a system of entry which is as harsh and horrible for them uh, as, as for the people that it particularly encouraged the rest of us to discriminate against on the basis of, of, of race and so on. Um, so what we have to do, and I think you're, the fact that you've engaged in these projects, the, the conclusion I've come to is we must seek to be closer to each other. Uh, uh, and we we must make sure that where we are engaged apparently on one issue, like let's say being a disabled person, that the other issues that are in there too, you know, about our orientation sexually, about trans issues, about gender and so on, that we don't just put those to one side, but recognize that's all about being all of us um, and have conversations with our different organizations, campaigns and movements. Um, that are struggling each sometimes a bit on its own, but bring each bring us all together. I think that has to be the way. I say that on the basis of giving it as much thought as I can and talking to other people. We 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 it really is true. You know, we can't be divided if we are united. So there are a lot of of, of I think squalid and siren political voices telling us to hate each other, even to hate ourselves. Uh, as it were, you know, so you don't want to identify as a disabled person. You don't want to identify as someone who uses mental health services. My partner is working uh, downstairs now as a welfare rights worker, and she will talk to people who will say to her things like, I've worked all my life. I've never got benefits before. I'm not like these other people who are scrounging. And, and she told me, she said once to somebody, well, what proportion of people do you think are scrounging? And, sh and she said, 50% and then her partner said oh no that's perhaps too many 25% and it's it's 1% and 1% are people are getting more money than they should and then if you look at the official statistics 1% of people are not getting the money they should be getting so there is a culture I think of individualization and to, to make people dislike each other which we have to challenge by things like this. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Emma, do you have a question? Uh, morning. Yes, I do. Thank you for your presentation, Peter. It was really, um, yeah, it was really thought provoking and interesting to to listen to. I was just wondering if you um, 
if you could say a little bit more about your views on universalist social work. So for, from my background, I come from a children's services and children's locality safeguarding service. And for us and for our perspective, particularly with engagement with children, actually, we're trying to move away from social work involvement. So, you know, in terms of our legislative responsibilities and in terms of, you know, um, actually trying to intervene on a, on a sort of the lowest level possible in terms of uh, ensuring safeguarding but also from from a perspective of supporting uh, newly qualified social workers and bringing them into safeguarding we're very much kind of thinking about manageable risk risk assessment strengths based approach protective factors you know and you know, particularly for our newly qualified social workers coming in actually when we see risk it can be really hard for them to then try and flip that on its head and look about look at protective factors and how we manage that safe uncertainty whereas actually from what I hear your perspective around universalist social work is actually kind of something that's a positive service for people and something that everybody should have you know equal access to whereas I think we come very much from a pro an approach that actually if children don't need us in their lives actually we'd rather take a step back so I'd be really kind of intro we'd be more about perhaps empowering families to do that work for themselves without a social worker having to support them yes in their times of crisis absolutely but uh, you know reaching a point where they don't necessarily need that so I was just interested about your kind of views on that universalist social work and and how how that might look for you really particularly with views to to, to supporting children's services I, th I don't I, I think what you've said is an absolutely brilliant summary of, of what decent social work is trying to do in the present circumstances and I don't think it actually conflicts with what I'm saying and I'm not suggesting that there is social work, as it were, as some sort of uh, grim auntie, um, sort of like interceding and interfering in the lives of families uh, just because it doesn't trust them to get on and do it in the way it thinks they should do it. The big difference I think that's happened to social work over the last 40 years, say, and if you if if you listen to what social workers used to say or what older social workers have told us in in the old days, social work and I'm not idealizing because there were lots of problems too and not enough involvement, but social work would be a service that was there locally where people would get to know people in the locality and they would not only be expected to intervene when things were going wrong. People would know them. People might not want them to get involved. People might, because they knew them and had heard about what they were like, have some basis of trust you might actually just bump into the social worker and know the social worker uh, through the street that could create problems it could also uh, create a kind of uh, ordinary contact and I think I think what's happened is that as social work has been more and more marginalized politically it is about it is about the pressure to firefighting. It is about an absolute determination to spend as little as possible uh, on adult and children's services and only to, to do anything if you have to. I think what you're trying to talk about is something that is, is a constructive alternative now to that. But I know from, I must be honest, one of our daughter, my partner's a social, been a social worker most of her working life, and one of our daughters is now uh, a, a leader of teams and constantly she will say about the things that her social workers her team leaders think are needed and how when you go to the directorate the management to try and secure them they don't want to know it's about budgets and it's about money and I think what's unique about social work it isn't just like counseling it's great emphasis has always been trying to understand and see the person on equal terms but the person in their context the world the person lives in the world the material world the world of issues that in, impact on the person for good and ill issues of discrimination and issues of material want and I, I think it's because it's about both it's always been about both uh, that they can be so helpful to many more of us the thing is in what's been palliative care social work, although that has of, of course been affected by austerity and it's had its limitations. It's not been strong historically on working with people from black and minority ethnic groups. That's begun to improve. But basically where my partner worked, for example, 
it wasn't a, 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 a residual service for just some people seen as a problem. It could be there for anybody, both in the community and in the hospice, who might need help uh, now that they knew that they had a life limiting condition or their family and support support people, friends and the rest would know that things were changing very much for them and, it, and there will be issues around their loss. And, and it was, it was it's that that's helped me feel that a kind of social work, uh, which was crucially, unlike much counselling, based on that serious connection of the individual and their world, uh, and the other principles that social work has, that was routinely available for many more of us, could only be helpful, I think, as the absolute opposite of a firefighting arrangement, but something that can help things not go wrong. You know, where we live now, I think there's only a residual uh, amount of social work, social work for adults. And I know this from recent experience that a kind of form of words will be used when you inquire to get social work support. But the person you're talking to is not a social worker. The person is, is an ancillary who doesn't make it clear that they've no right to present in a way that will make you think they're a social worker. And what their main role to do is is to ration and deny a service, a service which is so commonplace and yet which we know where we are and it's not unique. Many people lack it. And what we're seeing, uh, uh, I mean, what, 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 we, what we do see are, for example, very old people with adult children who are mental health service users, isolated with no support, no support for their adult children who have real difficulties, no support for them with the difficulties they're personally encountering, trying on their own to cope, and it's terrible. Thank you, Peter. And um, Julia, do you have a question? Um, no, I don't really have, I just wanted to emphasize that point because I sit on four NHS panels as a service user. And sometimes half of those people are all finance directors on the meetings. And sometimes I actually think, am I in a finance meeting or are they actually talking about patient care? So myself and the other service user have really turned some of it around already to emphasise that we need patient care more. That's, that's the main, main point, patient focused. I'll, I'll tell you a story from when I was young, which I went to buy a bicycle and th there was an advert for a bike. So I went to see the bloke and the bloke told me this is a long time ago and he was old that before the war, he'd been a poor law officer in the old poor law. He was a relieving officer and his job a bit like that of a social worker, but under very hard circumstances. And he told me the first piece of advice that his manager gave him was this. And I've heard this story from somebody else that a, a man was homeless. He went to the uh, office of the poor law to get some support and they said to him, no, I'm sorry, you don't qualify. The next day they found, this was in Brighton, the next day they found his body on the beach. And then there was an inquest and the magistrate, uh, sorry, the coroner gave the poor law local uh, officials a very big talking to. And what the old relieving officer said to me that the lesson that they had learned from that was it was a lot easier to persuade your manager that you had to do something than to convince the coroner why you didn't. And I think that's a, a, a lesson that there needs to be much more powerfully taught in, in, in social work education. I'm not criticising it, but there's so much to do, which is how how to deal with your organisation. Uh, one of our daughters is, as I said, a middle manager, and she says that when you go to the process of, of allocation to get help in relation to an issue which you know needs support, the answer you're likely to get is no. Uh, everything is about cost cutting and restriction, and I know she is a very determined person and she fights for her social workers and she fights for her team leaders, all of whom she greatly values. And that's what you have to be. I think you have to be like you're suggesting people prepared to go that extra mile uh, and have that determination, because if you if you don't, um, you, you're no kind of advocate for people who are having terrible times. But the bottom line is what matters now. It, it really is about money and Every so often something terrible happens. We've had two recent experiences of that. No one, no one in the major media says this is because 
uh, people have cut, cut, cut the resources of social work. They say it's because these social workers, as we've always said, are not good enough. No, it's not. It's a lie and people only discover the lie when it happens to them. So that's another reason why what you're doing is so important. Keep at it, please. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Is there anyone else who has a question um, or a, a, a comment for Peter before we go into the break? Yes, Glenn. Yeah, hi, Peter. Um, hi, I'm, uh, I have a son who's early 30s in support of living with severely and disabilities, and I feel we're going backwards. I think we're going back to the time where people with disability and mental health were locked away and kept out of sight because out of sight was out of mind. Uh, and specifically, my big um, drive with my local authorities is about the whole subject of inclusion. It seems to be that we're going backwards. It doesn't seem to be any efforts to actually include people with different abilities and strengths to be able to get back into their into their community because it's their community as well. And specifically, I've, I'm quite new to it. Um, the my son never goes out after nine o'clock because the shift changes and there's one person. And, and the more I speak to people, the more apparent it becomes that it is about money and it is about excluding people. And if you can get into bed at nine o'clock, then it's seen as a job well done. And I find it, I find it distasteful and it, it actually casts doubts about my judgments. So I sometimes feel as though I should bring you home. Uh, and I'm wondering, is that something that you see? across the piece? Uh, I've already, in one of my comments, I think I've already touched common ground. I think it's a truly terrible reality. You know, we, we, we actually had a brilliant idea that came from disabled people themselves of uh, actual direct payments that you could be, or people close to you that you trusted with indirect payments could be in charge of a sum of money and make the use of that, that they wanted to get those things that work best to support them in their life so that the impact of disability uh, was undermined by the resource that was there. So you could live what disabled people call a, a much more independent life and have the kind of possible choices and opportunities uh, that non-disabled people have got. And, it's a, and, and there was the independent living fund, which was a working realization of how that could be done. First of all, they got rid of the independent living fund. Then they haven't made a compensatory amount of money available to local authorities. And the pressure for social care is certainly not to recognise the, the simple reality that there are now many more disabled people in our society for all sorts of reasons and of older people with impairments and that that should be celebrated, not seen as a lie or rejected or treated badly. But that's not the way it works. Our politics are not like that. Our politics are about uh, other things which seem to make the, the lives of many people more difficult rather than. But I, I certainly would not suggest that anybody gives up. I, I, I'm not suggesting, on the other hand, that it's possible to keep going always because it's incredibly tough and people are put through a mincer, both as people supporting someone else and as the person themselves. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting, you know, years back, about 2000, we did a big study funded by the government, working with Leonard Cheshire, and we talked to, it was actually undertaken by disabled people, and we talked to both um, people using residential services and people doing using daycare support provided by Leonard Cheshire. And what was interesting was how many people who were in residential services with many abilities, uh, and, and it wasn't necessarily that good in those circumstances, when you ask them, said that they thought they'd probably better stay living in a residential service because they knew where they were and because they would not be in the position of having a future to worry about when they wouldn't know how the care was available, whether it was maintained at the level in the way they wanted it and so on and so forth. And that's true for so many people. I mean, I don't can't speak for the country, but I know from my partner's experience, I've, I don't know if there's one local authority in London that offers people overnight care. So if you need significant help in the night, then they're going to be saying, oh, well, there's no alternative. You need residential 
support. And we know from legal cases that quite inappropriate um, decisions are made through courts in relation to uh, what support people should have, which are effectively about the budget, because the budget trumps everything. Uh, it trumps it in the law court and it trumps it in people's individual experience. And that's shocking. And I think the only thing that's going to change this, it's my, and it's a bit pessimistic, you could argue, is of course that the numbers of us as disabled people, as service users, as older people, is as all the evidence shows rising. And when a point is reached when those proportions are that much bigger, then who we are, who all of us is, will be a bit more obvious and people will identify more with the issue and struggle more determinedly against governments or political parties that do not support or offer support in a real sense. That's my feeling. OK, thanks for that. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question before we go into break. So if I if I go to uh, Jenny, I think it's got a hand up next. Hello, um, my, Hi, my experience is largely working with faceless social workers where people do not have any ex sort of experience of context of my context because they're duty social workers and they have no idea of me and my circumstances. How do I get my lived experience understood and valued when I have no direct contact with the services that I rely on? And, and is this a problem that you see uh, in a lot of places or is that like quite unusual? I think that that has to be a rising problem as more and more things are, are, are done on the basis of seeking, as I said before, to firefight or to ration. And because there's this awful ambiguity, we used to think of things like social services as, as where you turn if you needed help. Now there's a whole process which is actually intended to off put people from getting help. And, it, and it's it's a, and that's part of the responsibility of duty teams. Um, I, I, I don't, I cannot offer any straightforward answer. The only thing I would suggest, which you, it may or may not feel appropriate to you, is, is, the, is the strength of doing things together. It, the big change that happened for me as a service user, where I at last began to make sense of what had happened to me and how I could try and challenge it, was when I joined up with other people uh, with with similar and comparable experience and then you begin to realize it isn't just you you don't have to feel bad about yourself as you do as I did and there's another way of thinking about it and you're more likely to get something happening even on an individual basis uh, with others than on your own I mean I, I, I only the only other thing that I've learned in my life is how you've got to gain all these skills um, to be your own self-advocate, which is not easy, but you can get them, people acquire them. I think people acquire them best working with others, um, how you can be more assertive, how being assertive can stop feeling like a, an incredible burden. It's hard work making demands for yourself, especially if you've got no one else to help. Um, but th there are things to use, like what are the what are the ethics and, and the principles of being so a social worker and to throw them back uh, at anybody who isn't clearly not observing them. I know somebody uh, who's worked as a, uh, a duty social worker overnight. He likes working overnight for years and the way he challenges uh, the management who don't like what he does because he works hard, I think, on behalf of service users is to throw in their face of their legal requirements and obligations and to warn them that if he doesn't do that, then something may go seriously wrong and they may be appearing on the front page of the sun. He, he is, as a social worker, quite prepared to use what I think are necessary but harsh approaches. And I think we are driven to that sometimes. Uh, it happened to me recently with my mother-in-law where she was I don't want to go into the whole story, but having a really tough time getting appropriate support. And I had to have a really nasty conversation with the leader of the occupational therapy team who was making absolutely clear to me that nothing could be done. And after after using the, 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 the range of, of, of a familiarity I had, the subtle threats that you can use, pointing out uh, that there are other people to draw in, like local MPs, et cetera, et cetera. Amazingly enough, 
uh, something was done. But it's a hard road, it doesn't always work, and it's a pain in itself. Um, and, and I think the systems are, are damaging. So the, the key thing, I think, is to have our own support systems and our own systems that can help us not feel bad about ourselves when we're engaged in these really difficult processes. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Now, I know that we do have another couple of hands up, but I, I do need to offer people a break now. So I'm hoping that we'll make up a bit of time and there'll be time to take um, so, some more questions a bit later. We just need to make sure that we hear from the other um, sort of project participants. Um, but Peter, thank you so much for, you know, for your speech and for the for the discussions afterwards. I know that people have found that really useful. And there's some comments in the chat um, as well um, with another couple of additional questions. So um, if you do um, get, a, get a chance to respond to that, right. that would be fantastic. Fantastic, and we will try our best to come back to um, to to, to Reshima and Emma um, a bit later on. And so, if people want to go and take a break now, and if we come back at ten forty, and for your passion, and for the way you've looked after us as well um, um, at the EDC. Okay, Kim. Hopefully, you'll see from. The feedback I'm, I'm really going to give about what it's meant for Warsaw um, having had the experience of all the, the brilliant training that was provided. So I just thought I'd start at the very beginning really as to why in Warsaw we, we actually want to be part of, of, of this um, project. And the first thing that struck me and I'm not going to spend too much time on this it is the strategic plan that we have in, in Warsaw. So we've got Sort of the models that we want, the uh, but the five circles on the outside are actually our practice priorities. And the th first thing that struck me was actually when you start to look at some of them for that participation um, and the family support model. I think is actually decision making um, and direct work. Yes, that that is a decision, but that's more around enabling. Sort of children, young people, and families to be active participants in decisions being made about them, um, and, and also understanding their lived experiences. But when I looked a bit close, you could actually say the same thing. Absolutely, everything is on the strategic plan because the lived experiences of people um, that have used. Um, some of our services, oops, I've, I've gone too quickly there, um, is, it is integral really and it isn't just about that sort of tokenistic, um, let's just sort of I'll put this politely, it isn't just about consulting, it's actually about looking further than that and if we're reviewing strategies, if we're reviewing policies, processes, then really we should be actively involving those that have experienced our services. So I could actually see the benefit of the program um, being extremely helpful in many ways as to how we could progress things further across all of our, our children's services services. But just to go back to my ASYEs, I wanted to make sure um, that we were listening to what their thoughts were. Uh, and so it was quite useful, really, that when I spoke to our cohort, these were the things that they came up with, which actually matched quite nicely with some of the things that were being presented to us as options. Um, again, the, the biggest issue, the, the biggest cause for, for sort of um, confidence, sort of lack of uncomfortable not quite knowing what to say or do uh, was around gender identity and that was coming from every one of our teams and my my sort of team's messages was often about how can we support what can we do how do we say um equally the gypsy roma and traveler communities um in warsaw don't always um see maybe the, the service that they should have again through lack of understanding and that was also acknowledged by some of our newly qualified workers um, in our family safeguarding teams we do have um, sort of domestic violence 
was um, working alongside our child and family social worker. But again, the, in, the sort of the interest really was around it isn't just women who are survivors. It isn't just men who are perpetrators. So that was something that we were really interested to look at. And obviously we do quite a lot around sort of raising awareness around experiences of being in care in Warsaw, but we were sure there was more that we could do to incorporate more of our sort of care lever experiences, as that was quite important. The other two um, we would hope to do the father's experience of, um, of social care and, and also the experiences of families where there's no recourse to public funds and also our um, unaccompanied asylum seeking children and young people. So we actually had four absolutely amazing topics to look at uh, and what our social workers wanted to get from that was they wanted more awareness, more knowledge, more confidence, a better understanding and so wanted to have the impact. They wanted to see that by having the benefit of hearing people's lived experiences would enable them to, to look at how their contacts and interventions with vulnerable children and families could be impacted by that. So could we improve outcomes? So we sort of came came to that with um with a very open mind but with a lot of expectation. And um Uh, was the challenges, which I know David has mentioned already, but I just thought I'd reiterate them from our perspective as a local authority. First was COVID. We couldn't use our training rooms. They basically closed the Education Development Centre and there was high levels of sickness, which meant that a lot of our staff weren't able to attend, even if we were able to offer more than 15 places. So COVID has got a lot to answer for. Um, the impact of COVID on staff absence through sickness was massive. There were lots of increased referrals, which resulted in teams being unable to release staff for training due to the high volume of work. And, and we could understand that. And, and so what was a real positive for us that came out of those challenges, um, we were able to the wider workforce. So in addition to some newly qualified staff, we also had experienced social workers, a team manager, um, family support staff that work within the social care teams and a, a couple of social work students. So we ended up having a really mixed audience and in some ways that's actually had an even greater impact um, for us because we had some social workers within those groups that were very influential. So there were challenges. But when it got going, it, it was amazing. And unfortunately, today is clashing with a, an, another conference in Warsaw, which is the, the launch of our um, ethnically diverse group and action plan. Uh, and so, as you can expect, a lot of the people that attended these programmes are, are actually attending uh, at that launch as well. So I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the participants and I have spoken to them and I'm going to share with you some of their comments. Um, I'll be honest, there wasn't a single negative comment from anyone at all. But this is just a breakdown of some of the things that people have said. Amazing, I love so much. Hearing their experiences was so powerful, it really made me think. So it was so open, it gave me confidence to ask questions. It has made me uh, rethink how I approach situations. I think I sat there with my mouth open the whole time. More people need to hear this. Can they do this for my team? They really need to hear this. It was hard to listen to at times, but it's given me a very different perspective. Are they doing it again? But great, really wanted to thank them for sharing their experiences. 
will this be available for everyone? Wow, wow, wow. Probably my favourite quote, and I think it summed up the, the general feeling. Definitely going to share this with my team. Give me so much to reflect on, so many ideas about how I can make some more changes in my practice. So I think what you can see from that, that those that were part of the training took so much from it. Uh, and it, it created buzz. But it also had some unexpected influences as well. Now, those of you that were part of, of, of the project will remember Terry in our bistro, who hopefully looked after you all. Now, Terry has been at the EDC since the year dot. And the week after the, the sort of training had finished, we were having a chat over coffee, as we, as we often do me trying to convince him that as one of his longest service customers, I deserve a proper cup and not a paper one. And he reflected spontaneously about what it had meant to him. And this is a summary of what we talked about. He acknowledged that he found it really hard at first. He didn't know what to say to people. Um, and, and given that the, the first session that he experienced was the, the session around gender identity he, he he struggled at first because it made him think about how he spoke to people generally and, and you know the conversation has but he tends to refer to any customers who are male as mate and any customers who are female as darling rightly or wrongly we have those conversations all the time but, but it became aware that was that okay okay for anybody um and he admitted he struggled, but then he came to the realisation as he got to talk to more people and more people were coming through the bistro and such, that he realised it was OK to be unsure, that he didn't have to be absolutely 100% comfortable at this point in time. It was OK, but equally, it was OK maybe to say the wrong thing unintentionally because that's the way he would learn, because he was really worried about saying the wrong thing. Um, and he also added it was great meeting such lovely people and having lots of different people to chat to. And he also hoped that he didn't offend anybody. And I tried to reassure him that, to my knowledge, I don't think he did. But more importantly, he hopes to see everyone again. So not only has this project had an impact on our newly qualified workers and social care practitioners, it's sort of gone further than that. Um, and, and talking to Terry, it really brought that home to me. And the caretakers who are also double act for many years, they, they shared similar. So we, I was really pleased to hear that. I don't think that when we're looking at the, the arena of training, I think it needs to be more general than that. So what difference does it make? This is a very simple summary of the feedback that I've had. Thinking differently, as, as been mentioned by so many people, um, I think the sessions gave people some reassurance. It certainly has provided lots of information that has made them understand more ab about the children and young people that they work with and some of the things that they are going through. They want learning to be more inclusive and I will come on to how we're meeting some of these um, sort of suggestions in a moment and I was really pleased to hear that. Um, definitely increased awareness. I mean so many people away from that thing saying I, I didn't realise, I, I didn't know that that's what it felt like. Um, I think again, um, the, the input of um, Hughes and, and Wilson in the gender identity session, I think the overwhelming thing that came from that was, I just didn't know that that's what you had to go through. We didn't know that that was a journey. Um, and out of, I think all of the sessions, that has been probably the most impactful because people genuinely didn't realise. Um, 
questioning, are we in participation or are we just paying it lip service? I mean, I, I am the lead for direct work and life journey work, etc. But are we actually actively enabling participation or is it just consultation? Are we really listening? And the other thing was we need to listen more. So some key messages came from the, the training that was offered. Board. So moving forward, facilitating training, leading discussion groups, and sharing their knowledge through co-production. We're currently reviewing um, our new learning offer, uh, and that will include more opportunities for people with lived experiences to contribute. This will include the ASYE training offer, the children's workforce training offer, and also the offer for foster carers. <laughs> Uh, the children's workforce offer doesn't just cover social work, it covers all children's services practitioners. Um, and equally, I've had some conversations with our safeguarding partnership as well as to how we can pull things together so that we've got that commonality across all of the training that is offered. One of the biggest benefits for us is the with people with this experience. I, I mean, I can't begin to sort of emphasise, as I've said here, the impact that these sessions have had. And, and this is the result of the willingness of those people in um, It's been great that those that have contributed to the training are willing to, to look at, to continue to work with us. In fact, some work around gender identity for foster carers is already being discussed. Um, and I want to use the momentum this has created to really move things forward as that's really, really important. Um, oops, doesn't want to move. And finally, what started as a small project that had the potential to raise awareness of the importance of constructively using expertise of those with experience to develop challenge and improve practice has become a significant catalyst to change, and I can't emphasise that enough. It's really pushed things and accelerated thinking uh, more than I ever imagined it would. Been discussion and agreement that this will be an overarching principle, not just for training, but also in the co-production of information for families, strategies, policy, etc. It will build on the work already taken by Children's Champion and Children's Ambassador in supporting children in care and care leavers to influence all of our practice and the offer made to them. And it has reached beyond the ASYE programme and it will make a difference. So finally, thank you for this opportunity. Who would have thought that so much impact could be created with such a very short time scale in the middle of a pandemic with the odds stacked against us? It's been amazing. And just really to emphasise, thank you so much. We've really enjoyed being part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. No problem. That was fantastic to hear about the impact um, of, of the project on your sort of social workers and um, and the organisation um, as a whole. That's that is really really fantastic, and very encouraging. And so thank you. Um, and yeah, who'd have thought it? All those all those sort of months ago, and you know those initial those initial stages that outcomes such as that, um, yeah, would have arisen. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I think next it's over to uh, David and Peter um, to uh, to come and tell us some um, of the, the learning, the key learning and messages from the project from their perspective as the project leads. Um, so if you're able to stop sharing, Kim, then I can um, share their slides for the next presentation. Doesn't want to stop, Deborah, so I am just trying to get rid of it. <laughs> no problem. I may have to leave and come back. <laughs> um, see if, I'll see if I can take control hang on he doesn't want to do it okay i can i'm having a go for it there we go right oh wonderful <laughs> thank you <clears throat> okay
Over to you, David. OK, Deborah, folks, um, I hope you can hear me all. I'm currently in the Lake District where you can't move for lambs and daffodils, but they've got uh, some Wi-Fi working, so um, really pleased to be part of this celebratory event. And David and I'll present it together. I'll take the lead on the slides and Dave will chip in as he will. Um, and I heard Kim's, Kim's um, accolades that really there. It is very unusual to run training events, seminars, and have 100% positive feedback. And I think it's, it would be fair to say that across all the uh, services we delivered, all the feedback we've got, all the uh, attitudes we've had from Terry in the bistro through to Warsaw senior management has been positive. Um, and one of the learning points for me, uh, I, I'm the, I facilitate the service user and care group at the University of Worcester, uh, of whom David's a member. I've worked with David for over 10 years, but one of the things I've learned about my own work with my own people who, are, who I work with who have lived experience is that perhaps we don't maximise their input. David's been a fantastic lead, he says co-lead, but really he's been the lead. I've been very much his glamorous assistant. I think that's still PC. I think it's still PC to say that. Um, and he's shown skills of organisation, negotiation, that really the way we work with David at university, where he comes in and tells his story and gets involved in debates and um, critiques work is great. But it just underlines to me perhaps how we don't perhaps, even in universities that are hopefully meaningfully involved in people with lived experience rather than just ticking boxes, we don't really always use their full potential. And that's been a big message to me, particularly uh, as, as it's exemplified itself in, in David's work. Um, there will inevitably be a little bit of re repetition, I think, in some of our slides, but we are coming at it um, much more from you know the academic, the lived experience point of view, um, perhaps first hand. And the, the rationale that you touched on earlier anyway is that um, it didn't make sense to us uh, that while involving people with lived experience is mandatory if you want to run a social work course, it's not mandatory, it's kind of optional if uh, once you're qualified. Uh, so in theory, you could qualify this year from the University of Worcester or Keele or wherever, and had had quite some exposure to people with lived experience, their perspectives on knowledge and um, services and attitudes and discrimination. But then you could go through the rest of your career without talking to people in that um, much more empowered, equal status kind of role that we, we, we work with when we're working in educational settings. And the rationale that comes back is often, well, we don't need it because we spend that every day working with people with learning disabilities, uh, carers, uh, people in distress, uh, children need safeguarding. We don't need it, we're there every day. It's bread and butter. But the reality is that the power dynamics are such when you're actually in practice that you do not get um, a really balanced, measured, uh, critical uh, perspective on your services. You, you're often dealing with people in crisis and the power balance, lots of social workers think they've got no power. You ask people with lived experience, they've got tremendous power um, and it's not always used in the right way, as sadly we know. So I think there is a there's a sea change of difference between working to people with people day to day and working with people in the hopefully constructive ways that we do run our university um, service user and carer, uh, lived experience groups. And the other thing I've perhaps learned as well, and this project kind of exemplifies it to a degree and we are working in the subcommittee on further kind of cross fertilizing these resources that universities have is that really these should be resources uh, the citizens with lived experience to the local authorities not just to the universities and although you know there is ad hoc experience across the country that people in CPD and assessed and qualifying years do use people with lived experience it isn't done in a systematic way. It's very much ad hoc um, 
uh, one-off type interventions rather than it's embedded intrinsic to the um, to CBD. So we um, we were very keen to push this and saw it as a missed opportunity in in the social work world, and we believed as a subgroup. Uh, of the partnership, uh, the uh, lived experience subgroup, that we did in fact have the resources and networks to um, deliver some training and we put a, a co-produced bid. Um, you'll have heard all about co-production this morning, but we did co-produce this bid uh, with um, with the partnership uh, from the, the, the subcommittee, which is made up of people with lived experience, academics and practitioners, and we uh, were lucky enough to win the bid and um, set, set up the steering group, which is actually like a subcommittee of the subcommittee with people with lived experience, uh, academics and professionals to keep us on the right track. So next next slide, please, Deborah. Uh, Warsaw came forward, as you know, they um, identified the gaps in their already planned CPD programme which could be usually delivered by people with lived experience and the gaps that they identified, as you will have partly heard this morning, were those of gender, gender identity awareness, gypsy, Roma and traveller issues, domestic abuse and the voices of children in care. And we, um, it was harder for us actually, because as many of you will know in the seminar today, most user and carer groups, and there's a, there's a challenge here for universities and local authorities, are adults. And for various ethical reasons that we never perhaps really explore as well as we could, we don't really have the voice of children and young people um, that profiled in those groups. So it was a harder call for us to um, fill this offer, given that it was a children's perspective, but we managed to, um, to, to do it with obviously the help of uh, various um, colleagues in other universities, networks we had already, um, ideally locally, uh, for example, with the, with the with the Gypsy Roman Traveller, we used Derbyshire um, Liaison Group who cover the Birmingham and uh, Walsall area. So we kind of used contacts we already had uh, between us to enable uh, these networks to be made up to, to be made hopefully local ones as Kim mentioned earlier can be kept on and, and developed and built on so next slide please Deborah um, so we delivered six sessions I think that is that six is that right David was it seven um, it was six plus the one that was co-produced by um, David Hughes and the yeah, Care Leads Council. Champion, yeah, yeah. Again, uh, fair dues to David Hughes. That rhymes. Yeah, that could be his slogan. Uh, great to meet him. We met him uh, very swift to meet. We talked the same language. Very much a can-do um, attitude towards the work he already was doing with um, Walsall Care Leavers Councils, and he was absolutely on board from day one, no, no no, hesitation, very refreshing, as I mentioned earlier with Walsall's overall attitude. So next slide, please, Deborah. Uh, standard classroom format, the Walsall Education Development Centre, which is in rural Walsall, um, more on the tourist trail than people might always associate Walsall with, but um, sort of an old school type building and took me back a few years when every local authority had these education centres and it was just just a great buzz to the place really and interesting to hear Kim talking about the caretakers and the Terry who runs the bistro you know these are key people to our organisations and in an increasing world where relationships aren't deemed important we miss the contribution we miss the fellowship we miss the ownership and the fact that there's been some kind of knock on with those folks who wouldn't traditionally be social work trained about attitudes and uh, social inclusion is fantastic for for the the citizens of, of Walsall and we did standard develop, uh, delivery powerpoints discussions videos questions and answers case studies uh, survivor narratives and um, some drama, Dave. David, you want, might want to mention the drama you did with in, in your session. How that um, came off? 
Uh, it was um, some awesome forum theatre done by Vic Kelly Tier and her colleague Bev, um, where they, um, well, basically Vic, Vic was coming home from work a bit late and Bev wasn't very happy about it. And they had this wonderful discussion. Um, some of the things, <laughs> some of the um, the comments were quite quite triggering, I have to say. And um, the, part, the the attendees were able to, uh, you know, to join in the discussion or stop the discussion and, and ask questions and, and whatever. And, and also to try and talk to each of the um, uh, actors, if you like, individually. And that, that was uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, I enjoyed that so much. And I, I know that all the attendees enjoyed it as well. Right, right. Okay, next slide then, please, Deborah. So um, it was challenging. Again, Kim has mentioned this very short scale uh, time scale. Once you get the funding, the whole, the whole thing um, was stymied to a degree by COVID. And as we knew, you know, a couple of months ago, it wasn't just the people had COVID, it was then they had to cover. Um, so it was a bit stop go. Was it all going to have to go online? And it was great that in the end we were able to de deliver it in person, not just for Terry's Bistro, but it was um, uh, a great lift for us that when it looked one minute it was going offline for it to be actually in, 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 in person. And as you may have been told already, we did open it up to um, uh, outside of ASYE staff, largely to get numbers up. But the benefits of that were that we then got experienced workers and managers who promoted the sessions to their own networks and were able to appreciate if they've been qualified 10, 12, whatever years, that they hadn't had this uh, type of training before uh, direct from people with lived experience. So it kind of endorsed and validated for the um, less experienced workers that this is, uh, there's something special about, about this. So next slide, please, Deb. <clears throat> um, Kim's kind of covered this to a large extent, and I mentioned earlier at the beginning there that everything we've had fed back so far has been positive. Everybody wanted more of this training. All the attendees, on the ones who filled in the feedback forms, uh, had at least 50% kind of growth in knowledge and skills, and some more than that. Um, you know, broaden my knowledge. Um, it was fluent and less scripted. Um, I, I, I felt immersed. That was a rather good term, I thought, there through the lived experience, which conveyed more of an understanding. So some great feedback, uh, really. And again, Kim's mentioned briefly the plans and this this phrase that um, seems quite trendy at the moment, but I do rather like it, a golden thread. Uh, running through their future work. I thought that that was uh, it's a beautiful phrase. I think it's actually from a fairy fairy tale, but this isn't a fairy tale, Deb. This is really um, happening. Um, so we have had already bookings, which again is a, in terms of impact of uh, a, a pilot project. The very fact that uh, Warsaw have already committed to rebook uh, some of our sessions already and indeed to widen it to other parts of the um, of the borough is fantastic. And we very much hope that particularly when we write this up that and you discuss after today that you'll look at wanting to get this kind of thing going in your own authorities uh, and mainstream this. This shouldn't just be a novelty, an interesting pot of money that appeared out of nowhere. And we it should be mainstreamed and it needn't be fantastically expensive. The value added is, is, is all there. Um, and the final slide, Deb, I think. So <clears throat> successfully delivered. I'm here today largely up in the north here, largely with health authorities, all saying how bureaucratic local authorities are and how hard it is to work with them. And they're always changing staff and you can't. But people, people can make things happen. And to me in Warsaw, the can-do attitude, exemplified by Kim, uh, and, and David, it, it, the can-do can attitude, it's a bit of a corny phrase, isn't it? But it was there, it was real. And the can-do attitude, I think of the partnership for this one, 
the uh, people with lived experience on the subcommittee, everybody contributing, everybody volunteering, Dave Gower's own, own um, leadership there, uh, fantastic. And uh, a nod too to the administrative people, they, they get overlooked, they're devalued these days, administration, but all the finance people, the administrators, all on board, flexible, helpful in um, making the systems flow around the job really. So we do genuinely hope this is going to be um, the first step in cultural change for social work CPD, where a genuine co-produced approach means that we learn from each other to the benefit of all. And the last slide, just a formal thank you. Um, and it particularly thanks Deborah Stewart, our consultant social worker, Kim and David from Warsaw. And here gets another mention. This is the Terry show, really. Uh, the wonderful uh, caretakers, Bistro Man at Warsaw EDC, and all the amazing people with lived experience who put together an awe-inspiring program in such a short space of time. So well done, everybody. And I'm really proud. It's lifted me being part of this project, and I hope it's lifted uh, people um, you know, across the region. The end. I could be lifted, lifted. I was asked not to sing, actually. Sorry, Deb and Dave. I got carried be, away. I got carried away with emotion. There will be no singing, thank you. <laughs> no, it's very welcome. Thank you, thank you, Peter um, and David. And I don't know if if it comes across from from that presentation actually how much work the two of them have put into this um as as project leads there's been an, an awful lot of hours and work behind the scenes going on to actually um bring this together in in times and with a time scale that would challenge the most experienced professional to be honest and it's it's been taken on so so well um I, i've been really really impressed um um, with the two of you as well. Now, um, I just want to really quickly um, just do do a little slide and just to talk through um, some of the learning for the teaching partnership as, as a whole and, and um, you know, what we're taking forward um, from this. So hopefully you can see uh, that slide there. So, um, you know, the, we're, this has been a, a pilot project um, with some really, really key learning. And I've, you know, just put something there in, in the chat um, as well about, you know, one of the things that that's really this has highlighted is um, is a better understanding of how to work together with people with lived experience so that they feel valued and seen as experts in the field and more than just a story. So it, it isn't it isn't just about and we hear this um, term being wheeled out and hopefully you'll, you'll hear a bit more about that with our people lived experience who are going to, to talk after this um, but that's been um, a key sort of piece of learning actually to looking at how it's going to shape our um, shape our the way that we work with people with lived experience as as a partnership um, and moving to a new way of working as well um so we're very much on a you know on a journey of, of co-production um but we're looking at you know recognizing that it takes time um, and commitment um to to make changes um so that we can work to a true model of, of co-production but that is certainly our aim and um for one example of that at the moment is um is that we we want to work together um to co-produce our own regional cpd program so right from the beginning stages getting together to um to plan that and also within the delivery as well so we've we've again made more connections with people lived experience um now as well so we have their knowledge and um, skills and expertise um to, to 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 come and work alongside us in in the work that we do um, we also want to make sure that we share the learning and experiences with our partners. So this has been the, you know, the impact on one local authority, but we want to look at how we can extend um, that, those, that learning and experiences with our partner organisations and indeed with other teaching partnerships as well. We're in a, we're in a national network, so it'd be brilliant to, to share the learning from that um, as well um, and just to share the, the, the good practice that's, um, that's been highlighted through this project. Um, and finally, we're hoping that this pilot will will help us to to, to co-produce another bid um at the department for education offer this um funding again that we can um look at co-producing another another bid um to bring the value of lived experience um as well across the region so looking at beyond just one local authority but looking at how we can um impact the region 
Um, so, yeah, so those were, were my thoughts um, on the, the, the key learning for us, which has been really important. And I know personally myself, um, not coming from uh, a kind of post before that that um, had a, a co-production or sort of participation role. Um, it's been fantastic learning, actually learning from the experts um, um, who are these guys. And um, so that leads me into introducing uh, Jenny and Wilson to you um, who are going to share their experiences um, of working with us on this project and uh, and delivering um, their fantastic training. So I'm just going to get your slides up um, Jenny and Wilson and it's over to you. Thanks Deborah. Hello everybody um, my name is Jenny and I'm a mental health service user, a member of the LGBTQ plus community and a peer trainer. My colleague is Hi, um, I'm Wilson. I am a psychology student, a queer trans man, and yeah, I'm also a long time service user of um, mental health services. And yeah, like I'm glad to be here today. Um, on to you, Jenny. So slide number two. Um, first of all, uh, just as background, we just wanted to share with you some of the topics that we covered during the training. So the overarching aim of the training was to improve understanding and awareness around gender identity uh, and we covered these six main areas. Um, although we covered these topics, the emphasis in the training was not about giving information actually. Anyone can Google anything now. It was more about creating a safe space to discuss and share lived experience and show by our participation that people with lived experience have strengths and qualities beyond our story that we were literally experts by experience, um, that we had experiential knowledge. Um, many of the participants came to the training thinking that they had no prior knowledge of trans issues and were nervous about saying the wrong thing or upsetting someone. Much of the work that we did was around challenging this uh, and helping people to realise how much they already did know and how they already had the skills. Um, they were open minded and non judgmental and they already had the strengths to connect with others from diverse groups. Uh, and that's basically all that we needed, really. Using our lived experience was much more around developing an understanding of why it is so important to be trans inclusive and using the DASA forum to discuss the issues and challenges that the trans community faces. And there was also an aspect about building confidence in talking with and about trans identity. Um, I'm not sure about how this training sits with your experiences, but we want a bit of time to talk about the feedback that we were given and some of the reflections and messages that we took away from this training. Can I have slide number three? So this is some of the feedback that we received. Um, we are sharing your feedback with, with our feedback with you, not to say how great we are, but to talk about how powerful sharing lived experience can be, how it can be a transformative experience. Lived experience trainers can provide a unique insight into the realities of their world, into their otherness, whilst demonstrating and modelling the values we expect in the services that we access. We think this work is important because of the ripples of change that it can generate and the real life impact that we can all have is, a very, is very real and important. By completing the training, we are hopefully developing trans allies that can move the discussion in their, on in their teams, with their service users, and in all of our wider communities. Slide four. So lastly, um, the evaluations we got were mostly positive, and this of course was affirming and validating. But what the main thing that we took away from this was that the process itself was sound, and uh, that although it takes time to be collaborative in everything you do, it is worthwhile. Having service users front and centre of the training only enhances the power of the message. Going to hand over to Wilson, who's going to talk a little bit more about his experience, and he's also going to talk about Jude's experience because unfortunately she can't be here today. Wilson. Yes, slide five, please, Deborah. So, though providing factual information is important, sharing stories through our eyes had a real impact on those attending the training, and I'm confident that voicing my experiences will improve the care of young trans and LGBTQ people. I feel like talking about my own suffering will protect some vulnerable young people from some of the unkindness in the world too. 
The people taking care of them can provide a real basis of understanding and protection from the discrimination we have faced. Though I have no personal experience with social workers in my own life, assisting in the education was very important to me. They are vital in improving the lives of so many young people and the fact that people made the time to attend our training shows how much they care. I don't doubt that they will use the things they learned in the training to help the children and young people they work with and I enjoyed getting to know them and seeing their passion. The work was definitely co-produced and was an extremely empowering experience. Though I'm currently studying psychology, I'm not yet qualified. However, this project has opened up so many experiences for me and has shown me that I am competent and the ways I have lived through and the things I have lived through can really count for something. In some ways, it validates my own trauma. Perhaps now I didn't go through these things for no reason, as it can genuinely help people. This project has helped me too. Throughout my life and my transition, I've battled with internalised transphobia, but doing this work has made me feel proud to be trans and given me a sense of purpose. The team in charge of the project really boosted my confidence. The training was a new experience for me, and since I participated in the project, new opportunities have opened up and I feel capable in my beliefs. Overall, this project really meant a lot to me. I look forward to the opportunities it will bring, knowing that I can genuinely make a difference in people's lives, even indirectly, just by being myself. Um, so the next slide, please. I don't know if you just want to introduce Jude briefly, um, Jen, before I say that bit. No worries. Um, Jude uh, is my partner um, and a non-binary person. Um, and she used that experience to talk about being non-binary. OK, so uh, this was written by Jude, but I'm just saying it on their behalf. I have found this whole project very empowering and worthwhile. My genderqueer journey started when I was quite young, but for many years I struggled to understand why I felt different. I was fighting with both my sexual orientation and my gender identity. The pressure on me from society to fit in and the way we treat those who are different from ourselves has caused so much pain for me and many queer and trans others. I don't want trans youth to go through the same. Being a young person is difficult enough. Being a member of the trans community and a young person is very, very difficult. And I can only imagine being a young member of the trans community who needs input from social services may feel impossible. And also, it's not just a trans youth issue. As an adult who gets support from social services, I still think it's important for those who work with me to understand me as a non-binary person as well. For me, it's vital that all non-binary gender people receive support from a kind, respectful professional that recognises their own bias and knowledge gaps and who is committed to advocating for my difference. Being non-binary is not something I've spoken about a lot before this training. Though this opportunity, through this opportunity, I've been more open about my experience and found it very rewarding. The social workers that participated really seemed to invest themselves in understanding me and I felt genuinely heard. I saw the trainees move forward in their acceptance and compassion of transgender and non-binary issues and growing confidence talking about them rather than being too nervous to engage. Like Wilson, I also feel strongly that it is important for me that my adverse experiences are being used in a positive way. Being part of this project has really tr transformed how I feel about myself, validating my experience and giving me confidence. Moving forward, I want to continue this work as I can see the potential for this training to bring about positive change, both for those who participate and by the ripple effect created by wider understanding of gender issues within all communities. Next slide, please. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of feedback as well. Um, I want to just get over this message. We've heard quite a lot today about not just being a story. As a service user trainer, I've been a participant in lots of training that was called co-produced, but it was often my experience that I was wheeled out to tell my story and then the training continued on without me. My ability to be a proper part of the training team was overlooked and I didn't feel properly valued. It was really important that right from the start of this project, Wilson and Jude didn't feel like this. I was determined that this training would be different, it would be, it would be properly collaborative and would embody the real spirit of co-production. I wanted to use my skills and experience to bring out the best in all of us, providing a structure together 
that complemented the lived experience and allowed the trainers to be their authentic selves, as well as providing training that was both engaging and transformative. I've had lots of personal experience with social workers in my own life who have often struggled to understand my LGBTQ plus identity. So being part of, of their, this tra training felt very meaningful. I understand that social workers have a really important role in the lives of so many young people they work with and their understanding of LGBTQ plus challenges is pivotal in the future of so many trans youths. We all feel confident that the social workers we work with will use what they experienced in the training to help them and we really enjoyed getting to know them and being part of their personal growth. The project has given me a lot more confidence in my ability to work together as part of the co-produced training team and more confident in the process as well as the validity of working in a co-produced way. Although the process takes more time, I think the outcomes are so much better for it being a sum of all of its parts. It was very important to us that the social workers who participated in the training really got something out of it and the feedback and evaluation indicated that we achieved this and we're so proud of this. We are also grateful for the opportunity you gave us. You made this work possible and we have really enjoyed working alongside you. Everybody showed us such kindness and belief right from the start, from the early meetings with the steering committee members, right through to the team at the education centre. We, we hope to do more work with you all in the future, as we know that our voice will be heard and respected throughout. Thank you. Awesome. Everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Jane, would you like to um, chip in now? Thank you, David. Yes, um, I haven't got any slides, um, but reiterating what's been said already this morning so much it was a real opportunity to be able to talk to people who wanted to understand but also needed to understand and and be part of this activity and i feel it was so important to have that opportunity i was introduced to it through uh, a colleague in our service user group in wolverhampton and uh, Wolverhampton University and uh, it's really been really good to be part of what's going on. I do do training for other organisations. I do training with the police. I do training locally in um, Shropshire where I live uh, and I felt that the groups that we were talking to really were understanding what we were saying. It was important to those groups that they learnt the elements that we had to offer, the information that we had to offer, the experience we had to offer. Gender identity is often sort of swept under the carpet. Oh, it's not important, um, but it is. And it's important for people to understand our experience our knowledge, very much our experience of life, <clears throat> how it affects us, how we're approached, how we uh, are um, actually seen in society or seen by social workers to take Warsaw's example. And the only way to be able to do that is to actually be able to uh, understand where we're coming from as people. Because at the end of the day, I know I started off my session by saying, well, we're all human beings and we are. Um, I've been really pleased to be having the opportunity to work with Walsall Council on this uh, and, and certainly would look forward to being able to be part of what goes on in the future, not only with Walsall, but also with this group, if that uh, can be um, part of the future. I listened to it with very great interest, what Peter Beresford had to say this morning uh, and, and very much support his, his viewpoint. To be aware, to have knowledge, to have understanding and have confidence is all part of where we need to be and everybody needs to be. But it's going to be hard work. Um, we've already heard that um, 
a lot of people need to understand where we're coming from and what we're doing. Let's hope that can be the case in the future and let's hope that more people do actually get that knowledge and understanding. I can say that the group we uh, work with works really receptive to what we were talking about and that's really been reflected in the comments that have come out this morning. Uh, and I'm you know, very pleased that that's the case. I hope that those people who have had that training can actually use that experience and use that knowledge in the work that they undertake on a day to day basis. So here we are. Thank you for inviting me this morning as well to actually be able to talk about my thoughts of what um, we've been doing as a group, as, a, as an organisation for training and particularly for social work in Warsaw. That's me. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you, Jane, and it was really lovely working with you as well. Thank yeah, you. that was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all of you and from my point of view can I just say uh, how incredibly powerful your sessions were, how incredibly informative your sessions were and, and it's just been an absolute pleasure meeting and working with all of you. I think we're on to our, our next um, topic of uh, training delivery now. I'm going to introduce um, Chris Smith from um, the who helped to put together the Gypsy Romany Traveller Awareness and Experiences sessions. Chris, can I hand over to you? OK, can 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 everybody actually hear me? Yes. Oh, brilliant. OK. Um, hello um, and uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, I've got to say I really enjoyed the day in Walsall. Um, my name is Chris Smith. I'm a gay Romany Gypsy activist um, from Herefordshire and I've worked in the learning disability sector for over 30 years. So I've had a lot of contact professionally with social workers. Um, I also train West Mercia Police in GRT awareness. Um, apologies if you see me looking down at my notes, but I'm quite old school and I don't have any slides or anything like that. And also um, apologies if you can hear my dog in the background, I'm doing my best to keep him happy. Um, so first off, I'd like to say congratulations to Walsall Council for having the foresight to accept that there is a need to uh, train social workers in GRT awareness. And I believe that the value of this training will become apparent when more social workers begin to see us as a legitimate ethnicity, worthy of working with, with a culture that's worth saving. Um, other ethnicities are valued for who they are. But this is not always apparent for GRT people, GRT people. We've lived with prejudice um, for a very, very long time. And there's always been talk about how resilient um, the GRT community is. But actually, resilience is all we have. Um, when we speak about things like the Poriamus or the devouring, as we call it, which is how we describe the extermination um, of gypsies in the camps during the Second World War, people are usually surprised to hear that between two and 600,000 gypsies were exterminated in this way. And this is a conservative estimate because no one actually bothered to count the number. We simply didn't matter and we still don't in the eyes of many people, including those in positions of power in government. Raising this issue with social workers is important as it puts us on the same footing as Jewish people, for example, who are seen as a legitimate ethnicity. 
Sharing our lived experiences of prejudice and racism is one of the most powerful ways of helping social workers and other professionals comprehend what it's like to face discrimination on a daily basis. We often speak about the statistics um, attached to GRT people, but through the training I provide for the police, I know that lived experiences cut through in a way that statistics don't. Stats are not personal. Lived experience is much harder to disagree with. It was also interesting, but not really surprising, to see that there was little or no understanding of which groups are protected um, under law. Gypsies and travellers are not one group of people. Rather, we're a number of different groups that are often put together as one and lumped together because there is a lack of understanding of the differences between the groups. When GRT people are lumped together in this way, it contributes to the public and various other organisations um, forgetting <laughs> that Romani Gypsies, Irish travellers and Roma people are legitimate ethnicities that are protected under various laws. Um, which helps to explain why organisations like the BBC still don't use capital letters, for example, when writing about GRT people. This training ha um, helps social workers to understand that the, the value judgments they make about our lifestyle are often wrong or misplaced. Understanding that a trailer, a caravan to you, um, often has partitioning that effectively creates a separate room or a bedroom, or that a teenager um, often has their own trailer in which to live and sleep in, is the same as having an extra bedroom for a house dweller, for example. So shouldn't be seen as a barrier to fostering or adoption, especially if the family um, live on their own land or on a local authority site. I hope that more authorities have the foresight to accept the awareness training, this awareness training. We need more professionals to see us as people rather than a problem. Um, and a problem that has to come into line with the settled community. In truth, less than 2% of travellers still travel on a regular basis. Um, usually due to the difficulty of maintaining that lifestyle and actually what we're seeing now with the crime bill coming through is the criminalization of the nomadic lifestyle. Um, this training helps social workers and other professionals to understand that being a traveller is not about whether you travel or not, it's about acceptance of our ethnicity. It's like saying if a Welsh person moves to England they don't suddenly stop being Welsh. So similarly, if a traveller moves into a house, they don't stop being a traveller. Um, I'm pleased to be part of this training and I really hope to do more in the future. And once again, well done Walsall Council. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And um, again, from my point of view, can I just say, how fantastic I found the session. I'd like to thank you and Abilene um, for everything that you've done. And I know how well received the sessions were as well, that people told me. <laughs> right, um, we're moving on to the domestic abuse sessions now. Vic, are you there? And Deborah, can we have some slides, please? So, um, we delivered um, two sessions of domestic abuse training and it was quite historic apparently. Um, it's the first time as far as we know that a female victim of a male perpetrator, a male victim of a female perpetrator and the same sex victim of the same sex perpetrator were all delivering this training on the same platform on the same day and um, from my point of view uh, as a male victim I know I've been doing this for eight years now talking to social work students and 
my tactic has become that I don't tell them to begin with what my issue is. I ask them to guess very non-politically correct parlor game. And when they pluck up the courage to guess, about three quarters of them um, think that I am a recovering drug addict and the rest of them think I'm either an alcoholic or a recovering alcoholic. And that's been pretty consistent. When I tell them that I'm actually a male domestic abuse survivor, I can see the shock on their faces as if a unicorn has just materialized in the room. And that has not changed in eight years. That shock that, that we exist has not changed. And I think it's the same for same sex survivors as well. We did cover as much as we absolutely could in a day. We had, we were very lucky to have Professor Ruth Jones at OBE who was responsible for setting up the Centre for Prevention of Violence at Worcester Uni, um, delivering the um, part of the training from the female survivor perspective. Um, and we covered all the relevant legislation, the definitions, what, what is coercive control, um, historical perspectives going back to the wonderful Marriage Act of 1753, which um, pretty much legalised um, wife beating and, and marital rape. And of course, we talked about who was affected, uh, not just the victims or survivors, um, but the children as well, uh, the effect on the children, which is often um, not really looked at. Vic, can I hand over to you now? Certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, do you want to move on to your uh, ne next uh, slide, David, as well? Um, okay. So, as David said, we'd, we'd covered those areas. Um, I was covering the same sex abuse area and I was very interested in what Peter was uh, saying earlier, um, Peter Beresford, in, in a sense that, um, so the training package that I put together came from my research, but the research was also co-produced. So it's interwoven with my own experience and we produced some forum theatre, uh, a colleague and I, um, to um, allow um, people an insight in a different way to, to that which they may usually have. And in fact, one of the participants did say we're, we're not present, we don't see conversations like, like this. Um, and I think it's really important, for example, in, in the light of recent cases that uh, have gone through the judiciary, that we, um, that more widely social workers, and I can say this as, as somebody who was previously uh, a practicing social worker, have an understanding that there are children in um, uh, households where where same sex relationships um, exist and that those children obviously are affected in similar ways. I was also interested in what Peter was saying as some of the research that I've done and spoken about with people focusing on identity abuse. Um, people, uh, social workers, other people more widely have a perception that <clears throat> in terms of same sex abuse it's about um, perhaps outing somebody, but the, the nature of the society that we live in and the way in which othering now works, it means that actually you can other somebody in different ways than simply outing them uh, as gay. You know, that the time when that was the tactic in some ways has passed and you outing somebody as, a, as not um, being stereotypically uh, normal um, in terms of compliance with relationship values and norms or uh, or perceived relationship values and norms is, is really crucial. Interestingly, while I was on this uh, conference um, this morning, um, we uh, uh, there was a uh, argument in the street. It's very rare that there is an argument in my street, but one of the, uh, the woman it was with seemed to look like it was between a man and a woman seemed to look like she could be gay now it's not me making this judgment by the way i dropped this in because he he had the the, the chap actually threatened her and she said oh that's a really big man threatening a woman and he he actually stood there and said to her you're not a woman 
when it's quite clearly obvious that that she is a woman and those those are the types of things so yet yeah, identity and i've seen one of the messages come across the screen as well in, in the chat so identity abuse is not something that is just limited to same-sex relationship and uh, relationships and um, it, it cuts across the whole spectrum of domestic abuse and is really important in terms of uh, for the perpetrator in terms of gaining control um coercive control and i think that those uh, uh, we we if, when we're intersectional with our approach and we look at the, uh, the 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 service user we're working with us that we find out when we listen to the service user we hear what their identity is is about and we we spot within that areas of weakness that a perpetrator might have um utilized and so i think it's it's really important to think things through in a different way because of the political scenario that we're in now um and i use that as a, as a small with a small p um so it was wonderful to to have the opportunity to do the training with the uh ASYE groups and I'd welcome any further opportunities. I think it, it was wonderful to, to work with David as a, a male victim with a, a, a female abuser and there are lots and lots of commonalities but also lots and lots of nuances that it's really important that social work staff and others start to become aware of um, as well as in terms of uh, work around gender identity um, as, as they do marry in that in that respect. So thank you to uh, everybody. I think the theatre work was very, very well received um, and it gives an opportunity um, for um, people to rehearse scenarios um, in, a, in a safe environment, a safe and friendly environment and, and see uh, the, the small and quite often the coercive control has come about through layered microaggressions um, and, and it is not the public story of domestic violence that most people are aware of, of the, the, the suddenly a full on attack taking place. It's not that, it's a, it's a build up of, uh, of aggressions over sometimes years. So thank you, thank you, David. I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted, wanted me to say. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Vic. And can I just say how much fun it's been working with you as well? Uh, I've, I've enjoyed all that and I I still have that surprise me <laughs> ringing around in my head. That was so good. Um, right. Um, just about running out of time. Very. I'm going to move over to Kim to uh, tell us about how it went on the um, Care Experience Day. I'm being the voice of, of our care experience um, people that, uh, that actually produced the, the session for us. So um, I wasn't actually really part of much, to be fair, as, as they um, designed it and they also delivered it and they've also shared their sort of feedback about that. So um, we've purposefully had um, half day sessions because Initially, we were going to use um, in the nicest possible way some of our, our young people that um, are care experienced, but with running total respect at the same time, we felt it might be a little bit too much to ask. So we focused on adults who had had experience of being in care and looking at what the impact had been for them. So we had uh, three um, sort of, uh, young ladies want of a better term who were delivering um, one of which actually facilitates the total respect training the the other two had never actually spoken to a group before and hadn't really shared their, their stories or experiences before and obviously were very nervous but the feedback from um Lashawn and from Sophia as well as Casey um, was that one, it was easier than they thought, but also for them, it was a really powerful thing to do. Um, they hadn't shared some of this before, but the whole process of doing so has actively encouraged them that they, they want to do more. So from our perspective as a local authority, that was great to hear, but actually to see 
participants grow during those sessions was absolutely amazing. The feedback from the participants was as expected. Um, again, really positive. Um, challenged a lot of thinking. Um, we, we did try to help the participants understand what it feels like um, to be a young person um, immersed in the, the care process. And I do believe that uh, LaShawn, Sophia and, and Casey did that remarkably well. Um, it was quite interesting, some of the techniques that they used, but it worked and it really did get people thinking. Um, again, even though we do use total respect, which I, I think other authorities may use as well, um, which is very well received as part of our mandatory training. We want to actually focus more on, on what um, Bashan, Sophia and, and Casey have done because they looked at it from a very different perspective. And different. So there were quite short sessions. It was a lot to cram in. Um, those that attended had lots of opportunity to ask questions and to understand what it felt like um, to be in care. Um, which I think was a little bit of an eye opener for some of the participants there because some of them did work within our, our corporate parenting services. So it was fascinating. It's a shame that Sophia or LaShawn couldn't be here today because I think it will be a lot more powerful hearing their perspective. But what they've shared with me has definitely been it was so worth the the level of discomfort initially and maybe a little bit of blind panic um, but actually the reality was it's enabled them to to also think about their experiences differently and how important it is to to use their experience to help social workers and others understand the impact of what they do so it, it was really successful, really enjoyed it. We are going to continue um, with that particular session. In addition to, obviously, there have been discussions and um, one of my colleagues from my training department is, is following up with, with everybody. We want all of the sessions to continue. Um, we, we want to, to use you all in the nicest possible way because the impact has been great. So although we already were doing some work around um sort of young people with lived experience of being in care it was really interesting slightly different slant and look at what that means for people when it's been several years out of the care system and what the impact that's still having so i can see that i probably need to shut up because we're overrunning but that was just a, a very quick sort of overview of the sorts of um of, of the uh, facilitators of the, the care experience session. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That's all good to hear. Um, and if you can convey our thanks to David Hughes as well for everything that he's done to get that off the ground. Um, I'm going to hand over to Peter Beresford now, um, back to our keynote speaker, uh, to deliver a closing speech. Um, I know we're overrunning by about five minutes, but I hope everybody can stay uh, just a little bit past 12. If that's OK. Peter. Thank you. I hope it's OK. You can hear me all right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think this has been an amazing session. I have to say that and I'm, I, I do use my words carefully. And what for me sums it up really is what what is seen as big and what is seen as small. And in our society, the things that we've been talking about today are treated at a, a global level, I think, too often as like little things. These are the things that are the really big things about human beings and about addressing issues for us and us understanding each other and reducing conflict and enabling well-being. These are the critically important things, um, how we understand ourselves and how we understand each other. And at the heart of this, what um, Peter called a golden thread, I think does lie this idea of lived experience and being able to 
draw on it in a more systematic way for it to be absolutely in there as central to everything. Some of the contributions have had a, an, an enormous effect on me because I think of, of my limited understanding of the issues. I found what I heard from Jenny and Wilson and Jude so helpful because I feel I feel that uh, issues of, around trans now are uh, treated in such a uh, a polarizing and hostile way often and here I felt I was having a chance to in safety get a better understanding um, to hear to hear about um, as as Wilson put it what we go through to hear the honest admission of internalized transphobia you know that to know that these are things which we need to work out together instead of having basically uh, conflict thrown at us all the time i found so helpful and then to to hear to hear the term used i speak as a jewish person uh, of the marginalization of, of 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 roma people and gypsies during the war and the holocaust that, that, that for you that's known as the devouring. I can't think of a more awful but honest and appropriate way of conceiving of it. You know, there's so much that's there. I can't do it justice, obviously, but centrally it is about, uh, in all the different domains that we've talked about today, one, valuing lived experience, to being able to have a sense of more confidence and safety that you know it's not about saying the wrong thing as we heard earlier about the bloke from the bistro but more important about trying to do the right thing um and 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 the people can as practitioners we heard make maybe small but what small positive changes by doing all the listening and this is the way to go you know it's the way to go in in every aspect the intimacy of our little lives at home for me um the all of us as as human actors as as citizens as people who are uh, open to the political process and should have a part to play in it these are the big issues and i i, I just hope that as somebody has said that more of us can be involved in these discussions so that we can all learn from each other more rather than being drawn further apart as sometimes as i said before seems to be the political aim i felt that there is hope for the human race uh, when i listen to what we've been talking about today and in these difficult times it's really rather refreshing to be able to feel that because without the human race getting its act together in relation to itself, we won't even have a planet. Thanks ever so much. Everybody. Thank you, Peter. And Thank you, Peter. It's been a real privilege and honour to, to have you here today. Um, we're closing very soon. Um, just like to say that we are going to hang around for a question and answer session after the official closing of the conference, if anybody would like to stay and ask some more questions. I would like to thank everybody who's been involved with this. Um, Deborah, you've been amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're staying on. Um, Kim, thank you so much for um, putting yourself forward to get involved with this and seeing the importance of it. And I've been as blown away, I think, as everybody else by the impact that it's had, because it's had an impact on me too. Um, can we see the illustration, Anna? Can you share it with us? Of course us? you can. Yes, absolutely, Ashel. Let me just see if I can switch my camera around because that will help me show it to you. Here we go. Let's just do that. There we go. Because then I should be able to see it. No, that's not doing it. Try again. There we go. Excellent. There okay. So I've got um, this um, will continue to evolve, but this is the poster in its entirety. And I'm just going to quickly talk you through how it's got itself to this state. <laughs> um, so we've got um, the beginning bit here is really setting out um, the presentations that you had about what the programme was about and the impact that it's had. Um, the middle section. Um, was Peter's section on um, his presentation on all of us and the last bit is about the learning that has come out of it um, so that's how it's been structured um, but I also just wanted to share the words that I've written 
um, in this deep pink um, because I think that feels like it summarizes yeah. um, what we've got. So this has been a significant catalyst for change. Um, you've been thinking about how people can be in control, where you can bring equality and involvement, diversity into the co-production of delivering training for, people, for um, social workers. Um, building people's empathy, understanding, compassion and trust. This bit along the bottom shows a shift from uh, them and us and recognising the importance of mending the gap that exists between social workers and service users, bringing social workers and the valuing the whole of you, um, bring it, being seen as an asset to bring your lived experience and social work into your practice. Um, this is about bringing your whole self to work, but it's also about bringing all of us together. Um, we're in this together. Um, but it's been transformative learning, a transformative learning opportunity for people where people have felt respected and that they've been able to work collaboratively. It's been empowering and people have been resilient through all of that um, in sharing their experience, but have gained a huge amount from it. And Peter's last words there were about it's doing the right thing. This is about doing the right thing. So hopefully that you can see there's a huge amount of detail in here, but um, hopefully that summarises what you've been doing this morning. Fantastic, Anna. And um, digital copies are available on request. Exactly. Um, so I shall get it scanned and there'll be a digital image, which hopefully will be sent out to everybody. Yeah, we'll do that and we'll share that with, with people and uh, the, slides, the slides as well. Fantastic. <laughs> it's a very small, but a, a very significant and important step, I think, that we've managed to take here. And if people are going to take one thing away from this, it is that we are more than our issue. Uh, our issue does not define us. We are whole people and we have capabilities Thank you. Uh, I know I, th I think we can probably f sort of formally close the, the conference. But I know, Reshma, you have a question, don't you? Who's your question for? I, I want for? to make a statement, actually. Fabulous. Just, yeah, just to say, I was part of putting the budget bid together. And I remember how we felt that, oh, should we do it? Should we not? Should we not do it? And I remember saying that if we're going to go for it, let's just go for it. And aren't we all pleased that we went for it? Like just listening to the conference, listening to everything, you know, and this has always been my mission has been, you just have to take a step and go for it. You know, we're not going to be able to do a massive big research project and things, but small things like this can make the biggest difference ever. So I think I just wanted to say well done to all the organisers, but also I'm so glad uh, I insisted that you should apply for the funding. <laughs> yeah. We're really glad to Rash that we had your your voice of of encouragement there, um, and yeah, and pushing us forward to do that because we weren't sure where we within the time frame that we had, and actually could could this be achieved? But I think thanks to to everyone who was involved, and and obviously to David and Peter stepping forward to to be the project leads as well. Um, it's it's been a fantastic experience. I think really positive. We're hearing really positive things from everyone involved. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, so thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to sort of formally close the, the conference there um, and we will stop the recording. Um, and um, I will <laughs> just let uh, Peter take a picture of uh, Anna's illustration. And um, so, yeah, so we'll stop the recording, but I know that David um, did um, offer to, to stay around um, to, to have some optional sort of questions and answers if people did want to did want to stay um, and if anyone else is available as well. Um, so I'm um, so yeah, again, thank thank you everybody um, for attending and um, I hope you all have a, a brilliant rest of your week. Thank you.